My name is Morgan Pagraki, and I look after a lot of our Hollywood engagements for video here at Adobe. Uh, before we dive into our panel today, I want to take a minute to briefly mention a few notes on Premiere Pro Productions, which you'll hear Billy and Russell talk about today, uh, in that it does differ slightly from a, a standard Premiere Pro project. Uh, so I'm going to just share a couple quick slides at the moment. Alrighty, so uh, Premiere Pro Productions uh, was actually designed by the team here in Los Angeles, who support a lot of our feature film and episodic engagements. Specifically with long form editorial projects, our team identified the need for a better collaborative model that would allow many editors to work together on a larger project. There's been an evolution of Premiere Pro projects over the last couple of years. Uh, several years ago, you could only open up one project at a time, which really made the platform a little bit more geared towards uh, singular editors. We then added the ability to have multiple projects open at a time, uh, but then each project had to be self-contained and that all of your clips and sequences lived inside that project. And if you tried to copy something over from one project to another, you might have ended up with duplicate clips somewhere along the way. So Productions was specifically designed to solve all of that in that it treats a collection of Premiere Pro projects almost like bins in that each project is part of a larger whole. So each of these projects in a production are actually linked together under the, under the hood, and uh, that flexibility allows for some better organizational options. So for instance, some of our editors like to have projects that are just devoted to organizing and cataloging the media, and then each editor can have their own project with their own sequence that they're cutting. We also enable the ability to organize and reuse projects. So there are some instances where we'll also see editors build out Premiere Pro projects that have things like music libraries, sound effects, and certain graphic elements so they can easily be added as they move from job to job. But if we take a look at what's under the hood, it's actually just a folder on disk that's managed by Premiere that contains projects and subfolders. But bear in mind, uh, we definitely don't recommend putting any media or anything else in there. Um, and in practice, all of your editors would just open a production and then from there open all the various parts of the production that they're going to be working on for that specific day. Uh, I also do wanna call out here that productions operate slightly differently from team projects in that everything about team projects hosts all of your project data in Creative Cloud, whereas productions keeps all of your data local or to your shared storage if you're working with the team. How you open a production really just depends on your overall style of organization. If you have a project and you have a particular bin structure that you prefer, you can migrate that into a production super easily. Um, on the left is a screenshot of what you might build out in a single project. You've got folders for your scenes and cuts, folders for your other clips and media, and on the right is what it would look like inside of a production. Each one of those little hollow icons represents a separate Premiere Pro project uh, file on disk so it's a fairly straightforward one-to-one -one relationship. Uh, and folks working on an episodic TV show might have a different organizational structure than say somebody that's working on a long form documentary that's you know, collecting media and clips over the course of several years. Um, so uh, I, I just wanna dive into a few of the reasons why somebody would actually choose to go the productions route over just a simple project. If you've ever dealt with a large Premiere Pro project that has thousands of clips and sequences, those projects can take a little time to open because Premiere has to make sure everything in the project is ready to edit. It literally touches almost every single piece of media in the project when you open it. So by breaking things apart, it means that you can get into the bits and pieces of what you're working on for just that session. You might not need to access lots of your sound effects for every single edit session. So you know, why would you spend the time cataloging those assets unnecessarily every time you open Premiere? when instead you can organize those into a sound effects project and instead just sort of pay as you go. So lastly, something to be aware of with productions is the concept of each project being able to reference other projects. We call this uh, pr cross project referencing. So if you can imagine these two lavender boxes or projects, we have a media project and a timeline project. As we edit these clips into that sequence on the right, you're no longer going to get a copy of the clip landing into that timeline project. If you've ever worked with Premiere before productions, you'd know that that didn't always used to be the case. And that was one of the biggest pieces of feedback that a lot of our top editors were giving us um, as it created confusion over which clips were the true clips that everybody else was using. 
So in essence, because of cross-project referencing, using productions will definitely save you some headaches with duplicate clips. All right, so enough of me talking. Let's dive into some more on devotion. Um, I'm super excited to introduce our esteemed editors that we have joining us today. Um, Russell Anderson is an assistant editor working in Los Angeles and has been involved in more than 300 commercials, music videos, documentaries, and films across his impressive career. In addition to assistant work, Russell also has a background in programming languages such as Python, JavaScript, and C++. Thanks so much, Russell, for joining us. Um, and also joining us today is the Emmy Award winning ACE editor, Billy Fox. Billy has lent his editing talents to more than 30 feature films, television dramas, and miniseries over the course of his impressive career. Billy's credits include really notable features like Straight Outta Compton, Hustle and Flow, Dolomite is My Name, Footloose, Coming to America, and Four Brothers. Um, in addition, Billy has also spent uh, nine years as the editor and supervising producer on Law and & Order. And uh, he's also known for editing and co-producing Band of Brothers with Tom Hanks and Steven Spielberg, arguably the best miniseries of all time, in my personal opinion. Um, so together, uh, Billy and Russell recently worked together on J.D. Dillard's Devotion from Black Label Media, Columbia, and Sony. Couldn't be more honored to have both of you join us today. And thanks again, gentlemen. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Great, so um, I'd love to start out by uh, having you tell us a little bit about Devotion. Can you tell us what the story is about? Devotion is the story of um, the first, uh, it's a Korean War film. It's the story of the first black naval aviator in 1950s. And um, it's, it's interesting that it's kind of similar to Band of Brothers and that it's the story of two guys and it's the whole crew of, um, the devotion crew and but basically these two guys and um it's it's uh it's got a lot of action but it's basically got a very core drama underpinning and the realities of coming into the military at that time sure yeah i can imagine um so tell me a little bit about the production uh when when did you guys start principal photography as as i understand it um you guys were shooting this movie during the, the pandemic. Um, tell me a little bit about how that played out. Uh, let's see, well, we started the aerial photography first in Washington State, where we had an entire aerial unit of, I don't wanna say hundreds, but say a hundred people with mini planes and cameras going up. Um, <clears throat> tons of footage was being shot based on storyboards with exact needs and requirements that JD, the director, had requested. And um, that's how the aerial unit started. And they shot in Washington State for two months, mm -hmm. something like that. Yeah. And then the aerial unit moved to the East Coast, Then, and they kept on shooting. And then the production side of it started in late January in Savannah, Georgia. And um, they shot for about four months. Yeah. Wow. Um, so over the course of the pandemic, did that? Did, how did that change the dynamic of how you two work together? Is uh, what was a ton different, or was it just business as usual for both of you? Uh, it was definitely a little different. I mean, I'm used to being by myself a lot during photography. Um, but in this case, I had never, I had met Russell on a Zoom call, on a FaceTime call, and um, had never met him. I didn't really meet him until six months into the production. Until we were in the office. <laughs> exactly. But so we were both situated in our homes, and uh, but with newer technologies, uh, it, it, it was as if he was right across the hall there was really no real difference. We used certain things like Discord, uh, LucidLink, Evercast. We didn't use Evercast a lot in the beginning, but it was, it was seamless. It was really great. And I'm used to editing at home, but the collaborative aspect of it is where it really just exploded and it became no different than being in an office. And, you know, he, Russell was here in Santa Monica and one assistant was up in Washington State and we kind of never knew the difference. 
Oh, that's great. Well, um, so before we dive into some more of the technical details, maybe it would be good to, to give the audience a sense about your roles and responsibilities as an editor and assistant editor, respectively. Um, t tell, me, tell me how you divide up, uh, you know, the, the share of the editorial work. Russell, you want to go first? Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, on my end, uh, the assistant editor's job is mainly to uh, you know, at, at its core, make make Billy's job as easy as possible. It's to it's really to support the editor and to to make sure um, you know all material is readily accessible. And you know, Billy's not he's not digging through things and you know, kind of wasting his time on the clerical side of things. He can just he can jump into exactly what he needs when he needs it. You know, ideally, even before he even knows he needs it, <laughs> you can have you can have things ready. So that's uh, you know, I, I'd say a lot of. A lot of you know what happens in the assistant editing world um yeah and then i think outside of that it's it's a lot of uh designing workflows to communicate with different departments and uh coming up with the best course of action to uh, get things over to sound and to uh, visual effects and music and all those kind of things great um, um and and tell me tell me about your role, Billy. Um, so before production starts, I like to get involved on a technical level and look at the editorial workflow and see what pieces of gear can be improved and what we can do to make the process more creative, flow smoother. But at a certain point, and it's usually like about um, two, three, four, two, two or three weeks before production, I stop. And I knew no more technical. And it's basically, Russell, you got this. And I just say, that's it. And I am all in about the cut. I'm all in on the edit. And Russell, it's just great. I mean, understanding that any given day, I'll get anywhere from, with an aerial unit, I'll get anywhere from two, three hours of dailies to 14, 15 hours of dailies. And uh, the aerial unit would shoot sometimes 18 hours of dailies because a, a, a plane would go up with six cameras. And so all of that would have to be ingested and synced up and made as a multicam so that all the cameras were in sync. So there's a tremendous amount of work to get the material into me. But I kind of, I just zero in and just cut. And understanding that every single day, I know that I have a tidal wave of footage coming in that's next day I'm going to get more, next day I have to get more. And it, I, I do the best I can to try and um, stay up to camera so that in theory, uh, at the end of any given work day, I've cut everything I've got. Everything has been cut. Now, it doesn't quite work out that way. And oftentimes I kind of slip and slip and slip. But um, so our two roles just kind of work hand in hand and, and we work together, but also different domains. And as Russell was saying, he not only has to deal with me, but he has to deal with the visual effects world and the DI world and the sound world and the music world where I don't really have to deal with that really at all. Yeah, and to Billy, your point on production, because um, it is sort of two two very distinctly different phases for both of us. Um, yeah. When we're in production, yeah, it's trying to it's trying to you know feed you, just feed you, feed you, feed you all the dailies and everything as quickly as possible. And what's really nice is that in the past, it uh, it could be sort of difficult to keep up with camera to really have everything coming in, or or you need to bring in a lot of people to really grind on things, and a lot of you know, technology and different, different, you know, more modern uh, approaches to this really allow you, really allow me to get Billy boatloads of footage to him, synced and organized and readable and uh, in, in, in a morning, really, as where something in the past would have taken, you know, days, which is terrific. Oh man, I can I can imagine. Wow, six cameras on for the aerial unit. That's uh that's intense. Um what I uh, just out of curiosity, what file format uh what what was your media format that that you were intaking for devotion? Um so we were 
in offline, we were, we were working with uh, ProRes. We were working with a uh, ProRes proxy and that, uh, that, that helped uh, keep Billy and myself and, uh, and visual effects and uh, our second assist all sort of in sync quickly because it allowed us to really rapidly shuttle files around because we were all in different locations. We all had our own uh, local copy of the media. Um, the cameras were coming in in a few different formats. You know, we were shooting primarily red cameras. So, uh, you know, we're shooting 8K red, 6K red. Um, but yeah, for us, we were getting, we were working in uh, ProRes. Okay, cool. Well, so I know that, uh, you know, remote collaboration was a big component of this. Maybe it would be good to give everybody a, a little overview of what the, uh, you know, 10,000 foot view workflow was with, you know, the remote collaboration element also playing into that as well. I know you used a lot of different methods for collaboration between Discord, Evercast, there was a little bit of Frame.io in there. Tell me how this all kind of worked together to form um, kind of this this remote editorial uh, pipeline. Yeah, uh, Bill, you want me to give a little just a software thing? And sure, you sure. Ch ch chime in on the stuff you liked. Yeah, uh, yeah. So we we um, it started with uh, we have uh, Premiere the Premiere Productions on uh, Lucid Link, which really created the the sense of just. Uh, you know, a network, a, a SAN or a NAS, or whatever, like uh, this real sense of we're all on the same system, we're all in the same space. And it was nice because, you know, when you're in Premiere, you can see very quickly, oh, oh, Billy's in this project. Oh, you know, uh, Ali's in this, you know, Ron's in this project. It's, it, it gives you a real sense of we're all working together and, and, and you know, a level of like fluidity. Um, we used uh, on the back and we used Resilio Sync for, for keeping uh, all of the ProRes files in sync just because there were, you know, terabytes of information. Um, and then uh, Discord we'd used as a, uh, just essentially as like a, just to communicate, kind of Billy had a, a, a push to talk and he could really rapidly just say, hey Russell, I need this. And, it, it can't, and again, it kind of, it, it helped bridge that gap where normally I'd just be sitting in another room and Billy would just shout in there like, oh, Russell, I need this. Or it, it kind of, really helped you know uh bring in that that fluid element so it, you know it didn't feel like you're making phone calls and it's always this very formal oh hello hello uh can you get this done okay thank you great goodbye like it yeah it kind of brought all that together um and then uh evercast for sitting in on sessions and real-time editing we didn't really use evercast until during production um russell and i didn't use ever cast at all for the most mm -hmm. part um, because you know it was but particularly with discord just to be able to hit this button turned on my microphone and I was able to ask Russell a really quick question the flow was just amazing um, when the director got involved um, we fired up evercast and I have a set of fourth monitor over here and that would be the evercast monitor so I would have my edit system here and JD and Russell were sitting on that monitor, and and I was really intrigued to see how is this going to work. I mean, I had never used Evercast before, and um, so I didn't know it was this going to be efficient. Was it going to be frustrating? Was it going to be? It was going to slow us down or what? And basically, I, it was incredible. I mean, we had a ball. It was no different if we were all sitting in the same room. Uh, it was it was great. Well, we I think we have a few uh, uh, techies in the audience that are also wanting to know what uh, what your computers are uh, and what your edit hardware looks like. Oh, I wish I could show you. Um, <laughs> I know we should have thought of that. I guess. <laughs> so I have a Mac Pro over here, the old trash can Mac Pro. I used to have cheese graters for years. Um, I have the uh, Avid uh, Artist Mix mixer. Um, I, I have a 5.1 environment. I have four monitors. I use the, uh, well, I'm not using Wacom right now, but I have a pen. Um, I use another company, um, Xsense, um, which are great. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of the same system, uh, pretty straightforward. Yeah, and I was on a, uh iMac Pro set up. 
Um, but also, I guess actually, this this is also because I think this fits into the that topic. We were also we were cutting in a, a, a left right center, so we we're cutting in 3.0 sound. Yeah, which introduced that's right. That's right. Whole interesting track. Sort of remote workflow. <laughs> exactly. I have a center track and then a left and right. I do have surrounds in the back. I think you can actually get over there, but I actually don't use them because they're it's it's too close. It's too confusing. To, but the three, the two one is great. To have a center track dialogue is really spectacular. Makes a big difference in mixing. Great. All right. Um, so I know that uh, I briefly mentioned earlier that this project was done on Premiere Pro Productions, which, as we all know, is it has a little bit of a different style of organization. Um, did this? How did this impact your media organization and per, and overall performance? Because because you're able to split things up into you know smaller projects. Um, how did you choose to re to organize this entire project? Did you organize it by um, days, by certain sequences? What was your setup? Uh, so um, production. Yeah. Uh, they came in uh, by, or we organized all of the dailies by scene. That's sort of the main the main thing. So everyone would come in. Everything would come into me. Uh, then, you know, that would be organized and that would go out into, into scene projects. And then, yeah, and then Billy would take it from there and he, he would kind of work on things from scenes. It sort of starts, starts in scenes and then builds into, into reels from there. Um, but yeah, for, for projects, we would have scenes, you know, music, sound effects, uh, eventually reels. And also, um, the, the, I think one of the most important ones is the, uh, is the shuttle project. <laughs> Which, you know, it just allows very quickly for people to just, you know, for any of us to be like, oh, I dropped this sequence into this shuttle. If you want to just grab this or, yeah. Right. And I know we, you briefly mentioned it earlier, Russell, about LucidLink. Um, and for those at, at, at home listening, LucidLink is actually a really, really popular solution for these types of workflows. Um, in fact, we use it internally here at Adobe as well. Um, it's not a shameless plug. I'm not a salesperson for LucidLink, but uh, we're, we're definitely big fans. It's it's essentially a, a cloud NAS. And the best part of LucidLink is pretty invisible. It mounts uh, just like the external hard drive would. Um, tell me about how you guys were using LucidLink in this setup as well. Uh, were you using that to share projects back and forth that were part of that production? Uh, yes, yeah, so that was for, uh... Primarily uh, the productions for the projects. Uh, we would use it. We actually were also keeping what else? We kept uh, we kept things like uh, paperwork and documents and things like that on there. Production documents. Um, we'd keep some lightweight media on there. So occasionally sound effects and music. Uh, usually that would end up getting migrated to the main main drives. But uh, it, it really it helped to be like a very 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 fast way of shuttling things around because sometimes uh resilio and the whole hard drive sync that 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 kind of has to churn a little bit more but uh yeah lucid was 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 much faster great um so as far as you know the tools that you used were you also using after effects and photoshop in a, in addition to premiere pro or what other what other tools did you use throughout the devotion process I used Audition. I used After Effects a medium amount, not a lot. Photoshop I didn't use at all. Um, no, the, the 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 sound uh, features in Premiere and the effects features in Premiere. I didn't have to go to After Effects a lot, but I did. But I'm not as good in in um, After Effects. Russell's much much better than I am. So I would. Say Russell, I need this and stabilize that and do this and do that. And then he would just give it to me back as an optical. And it was great. Worked out perfect. Yeah, we uh, would do all that through dynamic link. Dynamic you, link render replace. Talking about the production panel, do you want to see the layout? Or... Yeah. All right, let's yeah, see if that, we can do this. That would be fantastic. Yeah. Oh, cool. Huh? I think I've got it. Let's see. Uh, hold on. So all this other stuff, forget it. It's right here. This is this is the world. This this is the production panel right here. 
And basically our world is organized basically like that, that transfer folder, that closet, and uh, what Russell was saying, this we put that at the top. That's when we want to, you know, pong something back and forth. Okay, then the next thing, and trying to do it in an order of priority, is um, the reels. So each reel is its own project. And as you can see, I have reel one open. So here's reel two, three, four, five, six, and seven. And so anyone else can jump on that reel and do some work in reel three and reel five. So these are that's the most important thing. This whip cuts, that's my world. This is where I'm um, gonna do some extensive work on something. I pull it out of the cut. This is my world while I, I'll be changing some stuff. And when I'm all done, I put it back into the God edit. And then what Russell, this is if I've done stuff and I want Russell to put it back, so I'll put it in the put back in cut folder. Um, and then here's your dailies. Okay, starting with scene six. And as you can see, we have a lot of dailies. So you'll open any one of these and there could be anywhere from 20 to 120 clips associated to any one of these, depending on Scene 43 and scene 23 and scene 25. I forgot we were we were utilizing the fact that we could use emojis. <laughs> yes, exactly. Exactly. We use those to kind of make it stick out a little more. This is the aerial, one of the big sequences, the bear cat. This is another of the big sequences, the montage. Yeah. Yeah, and here's see this one, this one. It just makes you when you're looking for something, it makes it stick out a little more. Uh, these are string outs. I didn't really deal with this one too much. This is more Russell's world. File cabinet. Oh, this is my little, okay, I create a thing called a toolbox, which has got all kinds of important things in it, you know, leader, test footage, filters, if, just all kinds of stuff that I use all the time. So I'll open the toolbox and it'll just live up here. Um, then we have sound effects, ADR lines, music broken out into source music, score music, and AF, AAF uh, assets. And then effects and format material, mix downs, visual effects. So everything's broken down. So if you're looking for something, you, you just go into the world that you're interested in. If it's a visual effect, here's all of the visual effect breakdowns. In uh, Devotion, we have about a thousand visual effects and each Visual effect, God, has 10, if not more, versions. So right there, you've got 10,000 clips. And that's actually a very conservative number. So that's basically it. But this, this is where you find everything. 